Great to see you all here on a holiday weekend. The last day of 2023. I'm here for another year. Hallelujah. And it's good to see you here. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a great year. And I, I've only been here for part of it. I, I know I'm one of the newer guys here. But kind of before we jump in, we're going to talk a little bit about what, what does uh, TLC look like in, in 2024? What does being in Acts 242 church look like for the Lamb's Chapel in 2024? That's our, that's our message today. But I, I just want to talk a little bit because this year is, is, is set up by last year. The last 12, 14 months have been uh, a, a time period of extensive change at the Lamb's Chapel. There's no other way to say that. Uh, I mean, we go back... A, approximately 14 months ago, and a generational pastor resigned. He, he, he said he was resigning, and, and a new pastor was brought in. Now, the truth of the matter is, when you lose a generational pastor at a large church like ours, a person that's been around for that many years, usually the next guy that comes in, at least anecdotally, is, ends up being an interim pastor. It's hard to follow a generational pastor and, and to come in behind it. But we are so blessed because Pastor Scott has done an amazing job. Yeah. yeah. Wow. He has. He deserves that. And more so the Lord. We just deserve to give thanks to the Lord for bringing that man here because he connects with people. He cares about you. Every Sunday I see him out here up and down just talking with people, saying hi. Uh, want you to know that uh, he's part of the family here. And so Scott's come in and that's a huge change all by itself. But then other things start to happen. Uh, Pastor Phil, who's been doing high school, we move him to young adults. That's a just huge hole. Kids move out of high school and they get into college and different places and we lose them from the faith. And we're saying, no, we're going to make a concerted effort to continue to disciple these young people as they transition out of this kind of high school, living at home, to being on their own, that we would be for that for them. But then we had to take care of high school, and, and Lydia came in, and then Jesse came in for elementary school. And, and Pastor Scott and the elders have made a decision, hey, we're going to focus on discipleship going forward. Discipleship is going to mean more than just the word as we go forward. And so Pastor Mike has moved to the position of, of our discipleship pastor. And Tess has come along, and, and she works alongside him. And these changes just kept going. Go, oh, and you got a new executive pastor in the process there somewhere. You know, I got a job. Uh, uh, it's, it's been uh, an incredible year, and it's been a year of incredible change. And so I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm a newer guy here, but... Uh, done this for a long time and I just want to say to the people that have been here for the years that have seen all of this change and have said no this is my place to stand for the glory of God I commend you I commend you I really do I mean it uh, it's hard when there's that much change I mean you got used to a guy and you got used to a culture and, and you had communities and, and all of that. And then all of a sudden, all this stuff starts moving around and stuff. It's hard to deal with all of that. Yet you stood the test and stayed with it. And uh, I, I, I just want to say thank you for that. It's been an incredible year, but it's also been a year of change that we've gone through. Now, 2024 is here. We feel like we're, we're finding our rhythm a little bit as a staff. Uh, in terms of our ministries, and, and uh, we're just seeing lots of new folks and new faces coming aboard, and uh, we're excited about all of that. And uh, uh, we, as we move forward, we need to pay attention to something. You see, I believe there's a, a very real evil in this world. His name is Satan, and he comes to lie, to steal, and to destroy. And there's nothing better that he would like to do than to take this church down. Especially when you get a church that's in the, the midst of so much change going on. To create divisiveness. To create disunity. To find some way to break this up a little bit. He Big bang for the buck for the evil one when he can take down a senior pastor. Or he can split a church. Or, or just cause all tons of issues and stuff. And I stand here to tell you today that... Uh, 
your staff, the elders of your church, and I know all of you stand in the same place with us. We will not be taken down. We will not. We're, we're, we're here. And we're going to continue in the glory of God. He, but Satan operates. He, he's a slippery kind of guy. He, he doesn't ever come at you. ever notice Satan doesn't come straight at you. He, 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 he's, he's like a submarine. All right? Remember the convoys? World War II, the convoys are going across, and they have the personnel carriers and the cargo ships and the destroyers and the uh, other uh, protective ships. And these convoys would sail across the Atlantic. Thousands of Americans uh, died on their way to England for the invasion of Europe. They never got there because they died because of the U-boats, those submarines. And, and, and I just, that's a picture that I, I just got, and it just resonates with me. Satan's like one of those submarines. See, the, their job was to uh, be undetected and, and move in and get to a place. So when they fired their torpedoes, you're done. Their goal, they didn't take long, random shots. They moved and manipulated and, and, and did everything they could so they could take shots and destroy. And that's the way Satan works. I'd be the first one to confess. There's been times when I've gotten myself to a place where I go, how did I get here? What happened? In a place where I needed to confess something and deal with issues in my life. Because Satan is a slippery guy. He can get in there and work on us. And we don't even know it until the torpedoes are on their way. And so I'm going to say this to you, just to keep the metaphor rolling here. We're like, we're on a convoy, a mission for the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, whatever you do, do it for God's glory. Do for God's glory. Eat, drink, dance, work, gather, serve. Whatever you do, may the activities of your life be glorifying to God. That's what Paul is encouraging us in, in that passage. And our convoy are vessels made to bring glory to God. And it has four ships in it. Our little convoy has four ships in it. Wait for it. Worship, discipleship, fellowship, and stewardship. That's our convoy. Those, those four activities of faith, all right, comprise the, the basic activities of the New Testament church. In those four words there, we, we see the picture of the New Testament church. And we're going to take a look at those uh, four ships. However, uh, I want to say this. They're not autonomous uh, uh, activities, these four things I just mentioned. They're, they're more like concentric rings. They really do overflow. So unlike the ships that are standing alone, these, these rings, you know, worship and discipleship and fellowship, and they all overlap at some level. Our primary text today, though, is Acts 2.42. Acts 2.42 is that beautiful picture of the New Testament church. And it says this. This is the word of God. Let's, uh, excuse me. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. Father, we uh, take this scripture and uh, we take this day as we look forward to 2024 and say, come, Lord Jesus, fill this place. Help us, Lord, in these different activities of faith that our little convoy would bring glory to the name of Jesus Christ. And it's in your name we pray, Lord. Amen. This passage shows us what uh, New Testament church should look like. It, it, it's this picture, if you will, of the believers that have come together and you see all these activities and they all fit within those four words, those four ships that we've been talking about. What will the Lamb's Chapel look like in 2024? And I believe the answer is a people together in worship, discipleship, fellowship, and stewardship. 
reaching, raising, and releasing undeniable followers of Jesus Christ. That's our mission statement. So we're going to take a look at this convoy, and we're going to start with the, 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 the lead ship, if you will, worship. Psalm 100 says this, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. What a beautiful picture that psalm is of worship. That's what the the whole focus of this, coming to God, coming before him, singing to him, knowing who he is, following him, being in his gates, coming in his courts and praising him, acknowledging his goodness through all generations. That's worship. That's what worship is. Now, our, our word worship, it actually is not a word that translates directly uh, into English from the Hebrew or the Greek. It's, it's an English word, and it means to ascribe worth to God, or even better yet, I think, is to declare God's worth. That's what worship means. It's from an old English word. And, and there are many words that translate out of the Bible, and we translate them to worship. Because in the context, different words were best represented in our language by the word worship there. So if you take a look at the Hebrew language, uh, it, 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 the Hebrew language is very much kind of a word picture type of language. It's an ancient language. I had a seminary prof once tell me, Bobby, one of the root words for the, the word mercy was the Hebrew word open hand. And it got trans- when it was translated, it translated to mercy in the context that it was used. All right. And so you get this sense of the word pictures of, of, the, of the Hebrew world were translated into words and were used. Whereas the Greek was a very rational thought process and the assembly uh, of different words to create words that communicated in a logical, rational way. So these are two really different languages in structure that we use to translate into the English language. And so we get words like in the Hebrew, the halal. Halal, and this word might sound a little bit familiar. You might have heard it somewhere when somebody says hallelujah. Hallelujah. It comes from the word halal, and it means basically praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It can also mean boast in the Lord or celebrate the Lord. It can be translated in that way, but sometimes halal is transferred, translated to that word worship. It's a good picture of worship, praising the Lord. Another Hebrew word, yadah. Yadah, same thing. It's just, it, actually, this, this is a very active word. It, 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 it really comes from a root word that means to extend the hand, to, to throw the hands forward, giving oneself in worship and adoration, to give thanks. I was up there in the corner of the balcony uh, a couple of weeks ago when we had the uh, uh, Christmas program going, and uh, it's towards the end there, and it just got to this incredible, great song. And like three or four of you, you just, you came out of your chairs and boom, those hands just went up. It was great. It was like you guys were all in rhythm. The Holy Spirit is all for you up right now. And the hands came up and just extended. That's that word. And guess what? Sometimes that word, that extending, it's translated to worship. As does proskuneo. That's a Greek word. Proskuneo uh, is this Greek word that means to to, to bow down, to kneel, to be face down. It's an uh, act of respect and submission. You know, in the old days, again, the king conquers another king. The conquered king gets on the ground, prostrate, hands out, head down, hoping to save his neck. Fully submitted to the master. In the Magi story, we read this. For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. That word is proskuneo. We have come to proskuneo him, to get prostate. So again, in that context, worship. This word worship just it comes from so many places. The final one is liturgia. A liturgia, that, that, um, it's used in several different ways, if you will, in the New Testament church. It means to gather in corporate worship, basically. But it's a gathering, a, a corporate 
serving, a corporate prayer, a corporate teaching, performing sacred duties. Liturgia is that word wherever you read something that the church, plural, came together. They liturgied. It's that Greek word that means corporate worship. It'll translate best for that. And so these four words alone are all four words that in some way in their context they're used can be used as the word worship. It's why we gather to worship God, to declare God's worth. And we're called to do that. And there's something about coming together in this place, in this setting, uh, that I, I think is special. There, it, it, our hearts get prepared through the music and through the prayer, through the community and stuff, that God might speak to us. That God might speak to us. And I think that's the reason why he tells us, I think it's Hebrews, um, do not forsake the assembly. In other words, don't stop meeting. Church, don't stop meeting. Come to the place together because something sacred happens here in this room. I know there are a lot of you out there that are watching us online. You're online and, uh, and you're watching us today. I'm not throwing you under the bus. All right. I don't want you to think that. All right. I get it. And sometimes Jill and I, we, we'll watch, we watch a service. We like to see it online if we can't get here. So I know those things happen. All right. But I, I would maintain that this, this assembly is God called and that we're supposed to be here and to be together in that worship. And there's something else I'd say about this. My belief, this place right here, right now, is a no-fly zone for the evil one. He has no standing in this room. The body of believers come together in the worship of God. Satan has no power, no standing in this place. It's a great wall of protection that we build right here against his torpedoes. So what will your worship look like in 2024? That's my question. And this is what this sermon is about, is being intentional about uh, uh, 2024 in terms of your worship. What will that look like? And maybe for some of you it is, hey, I just need to get there more. You know, I, truth of the matter is, yeah, I, I can get a little lazy sometimes. And I, I need to be at, with the body in the assembly more because there is something special that happens here. Or maybe it's something else. I know for me, uh, as an EP, executive pastor, I, I, um, my job is to oversee all the operations of the church and all the ministries and stuff. And so I'm constantly viewing uh, everything that's going on, including the service, from this managerial position. And the truth of the matter is there's days when I go home and I'm like, Bobby, you didn't worship a lick. Nothing. And I have to confess that. And that's my personal goal for 2024 is that when I come in this room to come and be in the presence of my Savior. That's, that's what I need to be doing. What is it for you? What, do you? what will your worship look like in 2024? You might notice that you got your hand out there today. There's, we don't have to fill in the blanks per se, but I just left you a couple lines. There might be a couple notes you need to write yourself and say, hey, what does this look like? Or a question mark with a word or something like that. And talk to somebody. Your husband, your wife, friends, your small group. Whatever that is. Asking yourself, what will my worship look like in 2024? The second ship in our convoy is discipleship. All right. And we made a big move in 2023 when um, the model of our church has changed. And that is uh, uh, the, to put that focus, that emphasis on discipleship. Scott and our elders, our staff, we're very intentional about this right now. We want discipleship to become something that is not just, you know, given lip service, but is an in integrated part of our faith and our walk with Christ. But it begs the question, what is a disciple? In John 2, we read the story of Jesus' first miracle, changing water into wine. That was a good miracle. And in verse 211, it says, This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. 
they saw for the first time, they actually saw a real miracle. They'd heard his teaching. They knew he was something special. There's something great. And then he does something supernatural. And they're like, whoa, dude, did you see that? He just changed water into wine. I suspect it was a really, really good wine. They're saying this is more than just a good teacher. This guy's more than a rabbi. This guy is something special. And we need to get on board with him. And they did. It says up there, they put their faith in him. It's like this sealed the deal. And in terms of their discipleship. Now, I don't know if they said, whoa, dude. Okay. It might be a Hebrew word or something that's close to that. But I'm sure they were astounded by what they saw. A real live miracle. And they put their faith in Christ. Now, a disciple is a follower. The Greek word is Matthias. Matthias. But it, it, it meant to be a follower. It meant more than that. Though. It was much more ingrained than that. It meant to be a learner. All right? And it was a kind of a follower, learner kind of a situation where these people stayed with the teacher. There was tons of rabbis that had their disciples that followed them and philosophers of the day that would have their, their disciples. And these disciples did more than just come sit in a class every day. They literally followed them around. You know, all waking hours, they are together learning from their masters. And these different teachers and rabbis had their disciples. They probably made a lot of fun of Jesus. I mean, they had to look at Jesus' group and said, man, your disciple picker is broken, dude. I mean, Peter, the mouth from the south. Matthew, a traitor to the people of Israel. Thomas, guy doesn't believe a thing he sees or hears. And a whole bunch of fishermen. Man, that must be a fragrant small group. I, I mean, you think about the God, Jesus picks a bunch of losers. They have the best and the brightest. And Jesus picks a bunch of losers. And he changes the world with them and they stayed with him for the best part of three years and they followed and they learned and they traveled and the last instruction Jesus gave was the great commission saying all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. God is with us. That was a message for them, and it's a message for us. Reach, raise, and release. Go, make, obey. That's the mission of the Lamb's Chapel. Our mission statement really comes from this instruction of Christ to his followers. And so Pastor Mike has, is shifting us into a discipleship model. We talk a little bit about the, uh, uh, we had the next steps last year. We just had two classes and like 91 people went through the whole thing. It doesn't take a long time, but for us to get that, that amount in just the first two classes. And next year, there's going to be a, a bunch more in our next steps classes. Um, they will guide you and inform you. Maybe that's a, a next step for you, all right, to get involved with that or a small group. Those are, those are great. I know Mike has some additional plans uh, coming, you know, the top secret. But um, uh, he, he really is going to pour into this issue of discipleship for us. And it's not just discipleship of others. It's discipleship of ourselves. Discipleship is this, all right? It says we're all being discipled all the time. Boy, I got a lot to learn still. I really do. And, and I have some knowledge that I can share, and I have some things I need to gain. And I know there's some of you out there that have years and decades of your walk with Christ and wisdom and teaching. And, and uh, I'm going to encourage you to consider, what does that look like? In 1987, I was saved. All right? I came out of a non-believing back, background. Didn't believe that Jesus existed. I didn't think there was a God. Uh, I, I, was just, I was one of those guys that made fun of Christians. You know, and the, the worst, the worst were the Southern Baptists. Oh, my gosh. The Southern Baptists for crying out loud. Really? In God's humor, I was saved in a Southern Baptist church in 1987. And uh, 
uh, true story. And, uh, and, I got, I, and I, we, my wife and I, Jill's over here, we got baptized uh, December 6th. And uh, we, we were baptized at, uh, at uh, Bear Valley. And, uh, uh, and after, I think it was in that service, at the very end of it, not right, somewhere right after this, a guy came up to me, hey, 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 I'm, free, I'm Zane. He says, I'm Zane. We got to get together. And I'm like, ah, uh, I don't know nothing. I barely know people. I'm really like weirded out. I'm like, ah, uh, okay. Let's have coffee. Oh, okay, I think you've already had some. Let's, let's have coffee. Uh, and he said, and it, you name it, place, time, during the week, whatever. And I said, well, I work. And he goes, that's fine. I go, Tuesday morning, 6.30, Denny's. I'm in. He says, I'm in. So I go. And I meet this guy, Zane Pronte. Uh, Zane is a navigator. And uh, navigators are evangelists, discipleship people. That's who they are. And uh, great organization. And then I come and sit down and he tells me I'm a navigator to do this. Let's do some dive. Let's just meet every week for a cup of coffee. And we'll go for a year or however long it we go. And let's just do that. And I was like, okay, fine. And so we started meeting. Next weekend he comes. He says, a little slip of paper. He says, here, take this. Take this. Take this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. He goes, memorize that. You got to memorize that. Uh, okay, uh, I'll memorize that. And I'd memorize it and I'd come back. And I had to say it from memory, no helps. And I did my little thing. He goes, okay, let's talk about it. And then he took me through the theology of it. And he talked about it. We spent a couple of weeks on that. And then I, I well, come again. And he's like, hey, Bobby, I got this. Hey, this one. You know, study this passage. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart you believe and are justified and on. And I memorized it. And then we went through the theology of it. He talked about salvation. And he, he talked about the, uh, the permanence of it and what it means, what it looks like. And he discipled me in it. And then another one, do nothing out of selfless ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. That's Paul in Philippians. I memorized it. And he spent two years with me discipling me and he changed the course not only of my faith but I think he changed the course of my life he discipled me it was not it was not rocket science learn some scripture talk about it learn a little more scripture talk about it who out there is called to be a disciple what was as your discipleship look like for you in 24 coming at you and going out Pray about it. Talk about it. Uh, maybe the next steps. A small group. Good discipleship happens in small groups. As well as fellowship. Which is the next ship we're looking at. If you've been a Christian for even a short while, you've probably heard the word koinonia. Koinonia is that word that just simply means fellowship. It's a direct translation. In Acts 2, the followers of Jesus were doing it together. It said this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. They came together and they gathered and had community. That's probably a good word in our language today, community. They were a community, a committed community might even be a better way to say that. I was in a small group uh, in Colorado for a couple of years. This was a few years after I was baptized. I'd actually started going to seminary. And getting uh, an education, I, I was convicted that I was supposed to do something more. And so I uh, stopped hating Southern Baptists, and then I went to a Southern Baptist seminary. I, I, I don't know what's going on with that. And so I, I, I'm going to the seminary, and I'm, I'm learning about stuff. And in the process of that, when pastor of my church said, oh, yeah, I want you to lead a small group. I was like, oh, boy. And Jill and I, we hosted and led a small group. Another life-changing experience for us. For a couple of years, that group uh, was amazing. Uh, we didn't spend a long time because I got a job in ministry and went to another church. But the two, three years we were together, uh, we started with the book of Romans and spent a year. We studied God's Word. But more than that, we laughed and we cried and we prayed and we shared and we celebrated. And for maybe the first time in my life, I had that experience of knowing what true fellowship was. They had my back and I had their back. 
And that's an amazing experience. And there's a lot of things going on in this world that never happens. But in this place, it's part not only of our discipleship, but being a community, a koinonia with God. The bottom line is this. We are not created or called to do this alone. We need one another. Listen, if you're coming to church, good. But if you're coming in and you're getting your uh, weekly hour of Jesus and then going home, I would charge, I would submit to you to please consider you're missing a lot. I say you're missing out on so much that the body of Christ has to offer you. And I'll add this. The other way, besides that small group, I've made some great friends, is through serving. <coughs> serving together. Get, find a place to serve. If you're in, be in. Just find a place to serve. You'll build some relationships, some friendships. You toil alongside somebody for weeks, months, maybe years, and you develop some great friendships. And that whole issue of serving brings us to our final ship. Uh, kind of like the supply ship. It feeds all the others in some way. It's that support ship that comes alongside. It's called okomonos. We would call it stewardship. Stewardship. It means the manager or the manager of household. That's the translation. One definition said a steward, manager, superintendent to whom the proprietor has entrusted the management of his affairs, the care of receipts and expenditures, and the duty of dealing out the proper portion to every servant in the household. In other words, the steward manages the property and affairs of his or her master. And it's not just the money. That's not what this is about. But to say to, the foundation for this is all of us are stewards, not owners. When we come to Christ, we have submitted all to him. It's all his, all right? He is the provider, and we are responders to his provision. Back to Acts 2. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Now, it's an interesting passage. Later on, it gives a positive note, but I think in the beginning when they started, you've got to keep in mind, this is a small group. This is a very small group. And they're in Jerusalem, and they're blasphemers. They're heretics. They, 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 the person they worship died on a cross. And they say he resurrected, but nobody can prove that. Nobody can find the body. Nobody believed him. He, they were blasphemers. Yet somehow this group were stewards to one another. And they stuck together. And they ate. And they worshipped. And they prayed. And they served. And they demonstrated something. Because the people of that city saw them and said, Wow. I don't know. I don't, might not agree with what they believe. But there's something special going on there. I'd like to have some of that. But I got to say the same thing about my Southern Baptist Church. I started going there. I, I dragged in kicking and screaming. My wife had been going there a while. People knew what a jerk I was and had been. And uh, uh, I'm going to this church and I'm, go, and I'm like, Ehh. so I go in and these people are nice to me and they're friendly and they reach out and they ask me questions and they seem to really care. And I come back the next week and three or four guys come up, hey, hey Bobby, come. And they're asking me questions and it goes on week after week after week. And there was something happened, and I was like, I think these people really care. Listen, I came from a background where caring was uh, not a commodity. And these people really cared about me. And it was insipid in the way that it started to influence me. Because they had something I wanted. They had something I wanted. And after a while, it would come and... Earl would be missing. I'd be like, where's Earl? All of a sudden, I'm the guy. I'm like looking for him. This guy had loved on me so much, I wanted to love back on him. And I came to Christ in that place. Stewardship and being stewards means being a servant of all that's going on. And it starts right here with us 
serving one another. That's stewardship. As the body of Christ, we are called to serve one another. It's our time and it's our talents. God said, hey, take this and use it for my glory. And that's what they did. And it changed and it got bigger and bigger. And we read later on down in the passage, time's gone by and it says they did and God blessed it. And it says they enjoyed the favor of the people. They went from this blasphemous cult of yuck to being this respected group of people through their stewardship for God. So they served as stewards together. And and even here uh, at our church, we've got some amazing servants at the Lamb's Chapel. Uh, Our deacons, our ushers, our elders. I don't know, for the first time, some of you might have seen our elders up here what was it, three or four Sundays ago, we had the, the budget vote, and Scott was up here with uh, the four gentlemen that are the elders of our church. And I don't know if you've seen them all together before or not. I know some of you are newer here and stuff. I, I got to say out loud, man, when I, I, Scott and I knew each other from long ago, and when this opportunity came, uh, I wasn't sure. I, one of the things I got to know is the elders. Who are these uh, men that are the elders of your church and I spent two hours with them and I knew this could be a place for me Lamb's Chapel you have some men of incredible faith they have been diligent and hard working they talk about putting up with the tax of the evil one so much stuff going on they, they underbelly a church you don't even want to know about and stuff they have stood the test of time and they love this church like crazy and after I spent a couple hours with them I said this is a church that I can serve at this is a place that I can be and you see you see all of them uh, everybody else parking attendants and children and you young adults and kitchen workers and caregivers and security and security And I know I'm still missing a bunch of folks. So if I did, I apologize to you for the easy. You didn't mention mine. God, there's so many opportunities to serve. And when you serve, you will connect. And in serving and connecting, you bring glory to God. That's that's our convoy. That's where we're going. I just want to encourage you. If you're in, be in. Don't come on Sundays, get your dose of God and check out. Come and find a place to connect and be a part of these things. Now, when I first got here, let's talk about money. Let's just go ahead and get to the money, okay? Because people always tie stewardship, oh, that's about money. It's a lot bigger than that, but there is a portion of it that has to do with our money. And when I first got here, I was told in a nice way, too. This was not a critical way. It was in a very nice way. This is not, Bobby, this is not a church where people are used to hearing the pastors talk about giving, it's just not who, it's not who we are as a culture. And I don't judge our previous pastor and what he did or anything else. For me, I kind of got to this place and said, why? I mean, in our country today, money is our primary resources. Um, the scriptures are clear that what we have is God provided. Old days, we, there was animals and crops and different things that were brought as offerings and some coins as as Israel developed and stuff. But today, money is our primary resource. And uh, we give of our time, we give of our talents, and yes, we give of our money. It's, It's a central part of worship. The very first acts of worship in the Old Testament were offerings. And it's never changed. It's an act of worship and it's a practice of discipleship. I put some scriptures together. I think the scriptures are up there. And you can look at those. That's just a, that's a small number. I went into the internet, that source of all wisdom and knowledge, and I just typed in and said, Bible scriptures concerning money. Hundreds came up with different uses of the word money. Now, not all of them were about giving. I want to be clear on that. There, uh, this is a small percentage of the scriptures. And, uh, uh, in, and in that percentage, some talk about helping the needy and uh, uh, having a heart for the poor and the, uh, for the, and the oppressed. Some talked about being wise with your money, practical uh, uh, information about money. 
And yes, some also talked about giving. But it's not about the amount. The New Testament is, does not teach tithing per se. The New, the New Testament uh, teaches heart. Paul said it this way. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. Not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. That word cheerful has kind of been softened a little bit in our culture today. It's a, a very light, airy word there. And stuff. There, if there's a more heaviness to it, I would translate it more like, for God loves a giver with a joyous heart. That there's a heart issue that comes with our gifts. And, and I don't give my money to a church. I give my money to the Lord. I entrust the church, the elders, whoever is doing all those things to that. I make an offering unto the Lord. So in 2024, we're going to talk about it. We'll pray for our offerings. We're going to celebrate God's generosity. It's an important part of your faith. But what will your stewardship look like in 2024? That's up to you. And that's the whole stewardship, not just the, the dollar stewardship. What does that mean? How will you serve? Worship, discipleship, fellowship, and stewardship. I encourage you to pray, talk, consider, interact, ask questions, talk to a pastor. What's your 2024 going to look like? Uh, pastor Sean and I were talking and came across a, one of the chapters in the seven habits of highly effective people. And it says, begin with the end in mind. It's the beginning right now, 2024. What will 2024 look like when you're looking back? In other words, vision is a good thing. Be intentional. Let's, let's try as a church and as individuals to be forward thinking. My good friend Ken Davis said... If you don't know your target, you probably won't hit it. There's some wisdom for you. Let's be a church that hits the target for the glory of God. So what's that look? I mean, practically, being a 242 church, what does that mean for us as a body of people? How does our behaviors look? And I think it would be something like this. Be kind. Be trustworthy. Be generous. Be hospitable. Be forgiving. Be merciful. Work hard. Pray a lot. And worship wholeheartedly. In other words, a people that undeniably reflect the goodness of God. Amen? Amen. Father, we uh, again say thank you, thank you, thank you for your goodness. And we look to be uh, your people, your vessels that live out your glory to a world that desperately needs you. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Hey, I'm Pastor Scott Graham, and we want to thank you for joining us as we reach, raise, and release genuine followers of Jesus Christ here at the Lamb's Chapel. Uh, if you want to know when a video drops or when we go live, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And send this video to someone who needs to hear it. And make sure you invite them to join you here with us live this week. We'll see you soon.